Um, let's see what this code does. We are requiring person meetup. We are requiring something called chalk. Does anybody remember what chalk is? Please raise your hands and tell me. Yeah. What is chalk? It's an API. OK, it's a facility to apply fonts and colors. Yeah, that's right, actually. <laughs> that's literally what Chalk does. Chalk is a library, um, a Node.js library that allows you to use colors in your console messages or in any message that you want. So it turns strings into stuff with background colors, bold, underline, and, and stuff like that. But the most important part is it's a library. It's a Node.js library that someone else wrote. It's open source code. There are, I don't know, 30 contributors or something to Chalk and every other package that it requires. And we are making use of free labor. Um, other people put in efforts for us, and we're making use of it in our code. And that is the, one of the greatest ways to build software. You know, if somebody wrote something, why are you reinventing the wheel? We're not doing it. We are not doing everything from scratch ourselves. We're making use of existing technology. It's literally standing all the sh on the shoulders of giants. Right? Do you know who said that quote? What? Yes, it's a quote by Newton. He was like, I didn't invent anything. I'm just standing on the shoulders of giants, like all the literature that came before me. And that's actually very true for software engineering as well. We are benefiting from the work of others. It's called open source. You are expected to contribute back to open source as well. And hopefully, you will do it um, soon in your careers. All right, Chalk is a library that we are requiring. We had something like a database. And then what we did was we created new people. Okay, We had Arman equals new person, Arman and the age. Mert equals new person, Mert and the age. And we created a meetup, Women Tech Makers Berlin. All right. And Arman is attending Women Tech Makers Berlin. Mart is attending Women Tech Makers Berlin. Oh, just a second. I forgot to record my screen. We have the Google recording, but it's always best to have a backup. So let me just create a new screen recording. OK, great, perfect. So we have Arman and Mart. And uh, Women Take Makers Berlin Meetup, Arman and Mert are attending the Women Take Makers Berlin Meetup. And then we were logging the name of the meetup with a red background in, in blue. So if you run this, so if I go to the second week and run it, I was seeing um, Arman, Mert, Women Take Makers Berlin. And then, we were saving this data, the meetup data, to a file called meetup.json. Right? And then we were loading it from the database. So in fact, once you do this, once you run this code once, you can actually delete all the code that you had before and just load it. You, know, you can delete everything. Just load the file from the database. And then, oh, and then log it. And you're going to see the content. So this is how databases work. This is what we're going to use in the future as well. We're going to be, in week five, we're going to be using a real database, MongoDB, which will do pretty much a similar thing. We're going to be saving records to it. And then we're going to be reading from it. We're going to be loading records from it and showing it on the, on the screen. So. The way we design this course is incremental. Every week, we are expanding on what we built. So next week, we're going to learn how to use APIs, Express.js APIs, how to build a web server. Um, and on week five, we're going to learn about databases. So we are you know, expanding it more and more every week. And by the end of this course, you're going to have a project, a real-life project 
a web project that um, that you can showcase because we're going to have a graduation day. As the ninth week, we're going to have a graduation day where you're going to present your projects if you want, of course. Um, if you present a project, we're going to hopefully be presenting you a certificate, um, and then you're you're going to be eligible for the internship positions. So it's a I don't know kind of a little motivation from our side and we're going to be helping you with all the projects of course that's why we have slack i have to admit i wasn't very active this week on slack um, for personal reasons starting from next week i'll be more and more active so um, you're going to be covered there all right um is everything all right so far we had the database we saved it we loaded it right However, now, if you notice, the meetup class has a method called print attendee names, right? What it does is it's printing attendee names that have attended the meetup. Now, will I be able to use this after I'm reading something from the database? So imagine we don't have any of this code. I just have the database. I'm loading something. And I'm right now printing the name of the meetup. That works. What if I want to print that the attendee names? What should I do? On the right, you see the function, print attendee names. How should I call it? Anybody? OK, what is not clear? Please. That's actually true. <laughs> Don't second guess yourself. That's actually true. What we want to have is loaded file that print attendee names. Why? Because loaded file is a meetup, right? And as a meetup, it should have that function, print attendee names. Like, it's very logical, right? Um, in the meetup JSON, you're seeing it. It has all the information, name, attendees, whatever. So this should run. I run it, but I get an error. It says loaded file that print attendee names is not a function. Why is that the case? It should have been a function. Yep. It's because I haven't required meetups. So let's require meetup. I think it's like this, right? Yeah. Still doesn't work. Why? Anybody? You can guess. There are no dumb answers, please. Wait. Um, would you like speaking into a microphone? Because I love the answer. Oh, could you pass it on, please? Uh, well, I guess the reason that it doesn't work is because print attendee names is a method of the meetup class. And um, we're calling it on the loaded file. So um, yeah, it doesn't work. Why? Isn't a loaded file a meetup? Well, it used to be a meetup, but I think it's not anymore. Yes, <laughs> that is the perfect answer. It used to be a meetup. It's actually not a meetup anymore. Why? Because it's um, when we stringify it, if you remember the code of the database, we are stringifying it, right? Here, when we're saving something, we are calling json.stringify. So what we're doing is, making a model of a model or taking a snapshot of a model. It's like a picture, right? It's like a static picture. We're taking a photograph 
of that object and saving it somewhere. And then we are loading it. What we do is we load the file, which is a string now. It's a piece of text. We load the file, and we do JSON parse. And it gives us a, an object. Just that. It's almost like trying to reanimate a, um, a dead human being. Halloween is coming up, right? So I, I'm, I'm allowed to speak like spooky things. Um, so what the load is trying to do is trying to bring somebody back up from a, from a photograph. Obviously, you cannot really talk to a photograph. Well, you can try. The photograph will not answer, right? That's just a snapshot of a person. That's not the real person. So what you need to do is you need a way for the program to understand that this is actually a meetup that we're loading. Okay, This is a snapshot of a meetup. So what we're going to do next is, now that we have this object, we, will, we need a way to tell our system, and in this case, it's the, the meetup class, hey, give me a new meetup instance that has the, the same information. So if you remember, classes have behavior right, and properties and state. So if you look at the file we have in the meetup JSON, oh, wait, didn't I do that? OK. Just a second. That's weird. <laughs> OK, I think it's there now. All right, sorry for that. Um, more challenges, interesting. OK, if you look at the, if you look at the JSON, it has the properties. It has a name, attendees, their ages, etc. Right, but there is no behavior. We cannot really record a behavior, an action, in a photograph. So what we what we need is a way to restore this behavior. Do I make any sense at all? No. Raise your hands if you think I don't make any sense, and that's totally fine. I'll try to talk a little bit more clearly. Um, so which part should I clarify a little bit more? OK, um, so what we were doing is we were recording snapshots, like pictures of our objects. And obviously, like, it's almost like taking a photo of a video in action. In a, in a photograph, there is no action. And when you look at the photograph, you cannot really know what the next action will be. You lost the context. So what we're trying to achieve here is we need that action back. We need the report functionality. Print attendee names is um, an action of a meetup that normal meetups can do in our code. And we were doing it before. But with the snapshot, we cannot do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring that functionality back. Because what I want to be um, able to do is when I'm reading records from the database, I should be able to interact with them normally as I was doing it before. right? Before we started deleting code, Armand and Mert were able to attend the meetup. right? Right now, they cannot do it. Because right now, when we load the data from the database, it's just any object. It's just an object with that name and attendees. Nobody knows that it's actually a meetup object. So I need a way to turn it back into a meetup object. All right, let's move forward and delete these. I don't need the meetup class. Um, or maybe I do. <laughs> so the way to do it is by adding a new function to the meetup class. So again, we want this to work, right? Loaded file that print attendee names should work. And the way I'm going to do it is by creating a new meetup instance out of this, um, this object. Let's do it very crudely. What I would do, this loaded file is, is an object right now. I could do const, let's bring meetup back, const meetup 
require meetup. What I would do is const WTMB equals new meetup, and it takes a name, and I would give it loaded file dot name. Um, yeah. So here's the meetup class. Okay. And when I run this, oh, it will be WTMB dot print attendee names. When I run it, I get undefined. Why? I actually don't need console log here. Print attendee names will work. But I, I'm going to get nothing. Why could that be the case? If you look at meetup JSON, we have the attendees. Sorry? I actually created a new meetup instance from it. And I can log the name. It's there. Um, print attendee names. I can log the function. It's a function. The function is there. This is a real instance. But I don't have the attendees. The reason is because our meetup currently wants only the name as a parameter. It doesn't accept any attendees. So when you create a new meetup, by default, the attendee list is empty. What I should do is add this attendees parameter to it, OK? And make sure that we can actually restore the actual attendees. All right? Now when I run this code, Okay, I need to pass it here. Loaded file dot attendees. When I run this, I'm going to get Arman and Mert. So that will work. What I did, again, to recap, I previously I was only having name as a parameter. I added attendees as a parameter as well. So that when you're creating a new meetup, you can preload the attendees to it, right? Why did I do that? Because in, our, in my JSON, I already have the list of attendees. So I want this new object to have this list of attendees in it. Okay? And then I now have the behavior. What I did was I loaded the file that gave me an object, object a plain object. And then with the information in that object, I created a new meetup. And now I'm able to interact with that meetup. right? Now, if I create a new third person, that person can join that meetup as well. Um, let's do that. I will require the person class. OK. And here, const emmer equals new person. It requires a name and an age. I say and 30. And then I can do, let's do this. I can do emmer.attend WTMB, right? And when I run this, you're going to see we now have three names. It's not very readable. Um, let's maybe make it red. Yeah, it's better. So this is a fully functioning object right now. I saved it to the database. I loaded it from the database. I created a new meetup with that information. And now I'm able to um, communicate with that, talk to it. OK? Um, there is a problem here. Whenever I'm reading from the database, I have to know exactly how to create that object. I have to know that I have to pass in name and attendees. Right? That's not very practical if I have to do this for every single class. Um, that's why our software systems will do this automatically for us in the future. But we're now going to see a way to do it manually. What I want is I want to defer this responsibility to that class, that meetup class. Because we are writing the details of the meetup class. In that class, you know that you require a name. You know that you require attendees, right? 
you have that information, you have that knowledge. As a developer who is writing the code for the Meetup class, you know what properties you need. As a developer who is developing the index file, you don't have to know. Because all you need to do, all you want to do, is to load a Meetup from the database. right? You don't care what it is, what it does, actually. So, or you shouldn't care. This is almost called a single responsibility principle. And in software, especially when you're working in large teams, you're trying to defer responsibilities as much as possible. The least amount of code you can write, the better. If you can get your job by writing zero lines of code, you're the best software engineer ever. You're not creating any load for, for other people. All right, so that's what we're going to do. As an index file, we're going to tell the meetup class to create a new meetup object with the data that I loaded from the database. Like, I don't care what that data is. Just give me a new meetup instance, OK? The way to do it is to add a new function to the meetup class. We call this a static function. And um, let's call it create for now. Does anybody know what a static function is? Please raise your hands and tell me if you know what a static function is or does. Nobody? Perfect. Great. Um, I hope you are not bored. Are you bored? No? OK. <laughs> um, a, so print attendee names is a method, right? It's a behavior of, of the instances of the class. So when you're instantiating something, a meetup object in this case, it has the print attendee names functionality, right? That functionality belongs to the instance, to every new instance that you create. But sometimes we need functionality that the classes have, the classes themselves, and not individual instances. In this case, creating a new instance, creating a new object of the meetup is something this class, a responsibility this class should take. You don't ask um, Women Take Makers Berlin to create a new meetup, right? That's already a meetup. That's already created. It doesn't, it shouldn't know how to create a new meetup. However, the meetup entity, the class itself, should know how to create a new meetup. Previously, again, I, as the index file, I was knowing it. I was saying, OK, I'm going to call. I'm going to write new meetup. I'm going to pass in a name. And I'm going to pass in the list of attendees. This is too much knowledge, too much information for index. I don't want to deal with this. However, the meetup class should be responsible for this. And the static functions, and um, notice that I'm calling it a function and not a, met not a method. Static functions are functions on the class that you can call. They're just like regular functions that are just attached to the class. And they can do whatever you want. The instances that you create, the objects that you create, cannot access them. They are at a higher level. So for example, in this case, WTMB doesn't have a create method. But Meetup has a create method. And what this is going to do is very simple. It's just going to return a new Meetup. Okay. And I should be calling it here. Instead of creating a new meetup myself, I should say WTMB is meetup.create loaded file. OK? Now, what did I do here? I removed, first of all, I removed the keyword new. Because from now on, I won't have to create new instances myself. That's not my responsibility. Again, that's the, the meetup entity's responsibility. And because maybe, maybe, in order to create a new meetup, you don't have to use the keyword war, uh, keyword new. Maybe it's saved somewhere in the database, in some cache mechanism, in another file. And that's how it's going to fetch the information, right? I don't have to know how to fetch, how to create a new meetup. But the meetup class will know. What I'm doing is I'm passing in the database that I loaded the object that I loaded from the database into that create method, uh, create function. Okay, I say meetup.create loaded file, and I expect it to work. In this case, 
if I run this, how many names will I see? Anybody, please raise your hands and tell me. How many names will I see in this case? We have, in the database, we have Arman and Mert attending the meetup. And here we have Umur as a third person attending, attending the meetup on, the, um, on line eight. Please raise your hands. When I run this, how many names will I see? Uh, we're going to see two names because we don't save Umur to the database, all right? Anyone else? Yes. We're going to see three names, all the three names. Anyone else? Going up. Selling. <laughs> Selling. Sold. Is it, is it the, please. Zero names. All right. <laughs> Why? OK. Uh, I'm glad that you don't have the microphone. I'm going to play this game a little bit more, because that's the right answer. Um, anyone else? Meetup create is not a function, but I added it here to the meetup class. Yeah, so it's there. It's a static function. Please. It's going to throw an exception. Great. OK, let's see, because I'm not passing the parameters. Let's see what it does and how many names do we get. Oh, we only get one. <laughs> And that is Umur. Did anybody expect this? There? Cool. Um, yeah, why is this happening? Could anybody tell me? If you were expecting this, maybe you could tell me. <laughs> we don't care. We like fast starters. Um, yes, so I have only one name, and I'm only running what part? Which lines? They have line numbers. On line nine, yes, but why do I have only one person and not the people that I loaded from the database? Because in the database, I have two more people. Why do I have only a move? And another answer? Yeah, so that's correct. Um, and I already had the answer over there, obviously. Um, but I wanted to take this time. Because the reason is because we, we're, not, we're passing the loaded file to the create function here, but we're not making use of it. We didn't do anything with that information. So this should be an object. This should accept an object parameter, right? And it should have object name and object attendees. That is how you create a meetup. You have to pass in a name and a list of attendees, right? Otherwise, you're going to have an empty meetup object. That's what we did. When we didn't pass in name and attendees, we had an empty meetup object. And our code thought, you know, this is a new, brand new instance of a meetup. It's an empty meetup, and there's only one person attending. That's why you saw only one name. Actually, I can prove it to you. Um, let's do console log wtmb.name, and let's take this out for now. When you run this, the name will be undefined because it didn't even save the name. We're loading it from the database, and we're telling the meetup to create a new instance, but we don't process that information that we pass. So that create function wasn't processing the information that we were passing in. And when you have object that name and attendees, and when you run the file, now you see all the names, Arman, Mart, and Umur, and Women Tech Makers Berlin. Now, this is working as expected, right? I have the two names of the attendees, Umur can attend, so the functionality works, and I get the name and the, uh, the list of attendees. Do I make sense? 
a little bit maybe cool uh, there is an easier way to write this create function see the object is a parameter right I expect a real object there um, there's a different syntax to do this in JavaScript we can replace this by curly brackets and by typing the name of the parameters uh, of the properties that I'm expecting in that object. So I can say I'm expecting an object with two properties, name and attendees. And then I can simplify this just by passing in this name and attendees. All right. When I run this, it's going to work again. So this is a simpler way to build um, to build objects or uh, to use objects as parameters. Instead of having a blanket object parameter, you can actually go in um, a little bit detailed way and say, I want the name property and I want the attendees property. And now, whenever um, in my code, whenever I say, sorry, meetup that creates in code completion as well i automatically see this requires name and attendees as properties so it's already telling me that you know please pass in an object with name hello and attendees for example an empty array all right um, and when you log this to the console you're going to see that we're going to have a new meetup with the name hello and attendees and empty array. So this is a simpler way of writing it, which we like. It makes development more accessible because nobody has to know what that object has as properties, right? Your IDE, in this case, Visual Studio Code, actually shows you what you need. OK. Um, How is it going so far? You're lost? Great. <laughs> it's fine. Maybe they were not in your database in the first place. Because for this to work, um, you need to have a meetup JSON with them. Um, in order to get it, you can do first database.save. That's how we got them in the first place. So if you go back to the very initial version of this, it's going to be a lot of undos. But I hope we can do it. Yes. So in the first version, we were creating Arman and Mert. And then they were attending the Women Take Makers Berlin meetup. And then we were saving the database database.save. This is already in the code that we shared in the repository for week two. Um, and then we were loading it and you know going on with, with that. Yeah. And let's go forward. In the last version that we have, we're loading the database, or, or we're loading the, um, the meetup from the database and creating a new instance from it having a mirror attend to it, and then printing the attendee names. What I can do here is I can actually save the database again, and a will show up in meetup JSON as well. Let's do that. So I'll have it here. Oh. So right now, you see there are two records here. Let's say database.save. It's meetup.json. WTMB. And when I run this code, nothing happens. Why? Is it saving it somewhere else? Oh, no. Yeah, I was. I opened the wrong meetup file. So we have this, right? Right now it's in the database. And now when I load it, I'm going to have 
you know, let's change the name. I don't know. Let's say Juan. When I run this, you're going to see four names. Juan also joined the meetup right now. And in the database, it's already updated. Juan is in the database alongside Umur and others. All right? Now, this was, this was not even an example from week three. This was additional work from week two. Now I'm, I'm going to move on with asynchronous programming, the actual content of, um, of this week. Yeah. Can anybody tell me what asynchronous programming is in JavaScript? Wait. Yeah. Okay. Unlike synchronous programming, you don't have to wait for the previous request to complete to make the new one. You can have them run in parallel. Yeah. Great. Any other explanation? Anybody? What could be asynchronous program? You can also give an example if you like. And again, it doesn't have to be right. That's fine. We're all here to learn. Um, so, you know, anything that you can imagine as being asynchronous, please let me know. Raise your hands. Don't be shy. Come on. Like, we almost have like 80 people here. Please. Yeah. You can have several requests. Okay, the ones that are still waiting for an answer will be on the side, and the one that received that answer will finish and go on whatever, whatever they want to do with that answer, right? Yeah. Great. Um, these are all valid answers that are talking about what um, asynchronous programming is. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So unfortunately, I have to tell you, there is nothing called synchronous programming. Everything is asynchronous in nature, um, even your brains. So when you hear me talking, right? I actually have made those sounds 150 milliseconds ago. There's a delay in your hearing, in your sight. So when you're seeing me, there's a delay of 150 milliseconds. It's almost like if you know the sunlight travels in, what, eight seconds to the eight minutes to the Earth uh, from the sun. So basically, we're seeing, when we're looking at the sun, we're seeing an older version of it, a much older version of it, actually. It takes a couple of million years for those photons to leave the core of the sun. Nothing is real time. Nothing is synchronous. Again, your brain needs time to process information. So you have the illusion that everything is happening in real time as I'm speaking. But actually, this has happened in the past at least 150 milliseconds ago. So everything we do in life is asynchronous. It's just, it was very simple in the very beginning for programming to block resources. To say, hey, I'm reading a file. I will just read this file until I die. <laughs> Somebody kills me or I read the file and I won't do anything else. Um, I'm just going to read read this file as long as I can, because it's very simple. And you, the only way you can change the behavior of that program is if you can kill it, which is not very useful. So this is how programming languages were done since the very beginning. 
But then we needed something called the user interface. It is basically whatever we see and touch and click and interact with in our computers, even in, in our terminals. There is a need for the user to interact with the, um, with the program, right? For example, what can I do here in this page? What is a typical user action on this page? Scrolling, perfect. That's great, yeah, I can scroll, right? Does the computer know that I'm gonna scroll? No. So can it prepare for me to scroll? What if I don't scroll ever? It doesn't know when I'm gonna scroll. It doesn't know how much I'm gonna scroll, right? What else can I do with this page? Sorry? Click, of course. Um, that's what a lot of people do, right? If I like GitHub, for example, I can click sign up. And it shows me another page. Does it know if I'm gonna click that page? No. Does it know what should happen when I click that page? Yeah. Yes, what should happen? Tell me, what should happen when I click that, that sign up button? I have another window, I have another page, right? Um, how was it able to do this? It didn't know what I'm gonna do on this page. It cannot read my mind. Although there are some JavaScript applications that can read people's minds. Um, shameless plug, if you, <laughs> if you go to my Twitter profile, it's my pinned tweet. I can read your minds with JavaScript. That's why it's the most powerful programming language in the world. Um, yeah, some web pages can read your minds if you have the necessary equipment, but this page doesn't. This is not something that will read anything from my mind. It's just recording my voice, right? How does it know that I'm going to click it? Yes, event listeners. Raise your hands if you ever heard of event listeners or events before. A lot of people did, actually. That's great. Amazing. Um, all right, so... This is called event-based programming. A user interface, anything that requires interaction is actually event-based. Like if you're clicking some link on a browser, you tell the browser, hey, there's a click event. So do whatever you want to do with it. If you're gonna redirect to a new page, load a new page, I don't know. There's a scroll event. Whenever I'm swiping my trackpad, there's a scroll event and the browser knows, okay, I'm gonna show the next page. Or it knows how much I scrolled. And then it's gonna say, okay, I'm gonna show like 500 pixels below. Um, and if you look at it, it's almost doing it like 60 frames per second. So it almost like at every 15 millisecond, it checks where I am on the page, how much I scrolled, and shows me a different portion of the page. This is called event-based programming. Right, this is, the, uh, this is the main model of JavaScript. It's an event-based, event loop-based um, environment for running server-side code, because everything is, in fact, asynchronous and based on events, right? What is asynchronous here? I loaded the file, it finished loading. At any given time I like, I can just scroll. I can create a new event that is happening asynchronously. It doesn't know. It, it cannot know what, to, what event that I'm going to generate. It doesn't know if I'm going to generate a click or a scroll. So it has to listen to those events. All right? um, for example, let's create an event listener here for a click action. I'm just going to type it here in the console. I hope it will work. Uh, document body event listener click. Let's say alert uh, yeah this let's see if it's gonna work. Oh. So I ran some code, nothing happened. What I did is I added an event listener to the body of this document. It actually reads very simply, like document body at event listener add an event listener to the body of this document. 
that I have open. The event name will be click, and the function will be hello WTMB. Now, I'm telling the browser, hey, when there's a click on this document, on this body, call me back. I'm sleeping right now. You know, there's nothing that requires my attention. When there's an actual event that I should be aware of, like a click event, I'm interested in the click events, just call me back, um, literally. And when I click the page, you see the hello WTMB alert. What it did, actually, the browser called my function back that I passed in earlier. Okay. Now, this is event-driven programming, which means multiple functions can actually listen to the same event. Let's run it again. I added another event listener to the click event. Now, when I click it, it's going to first say, hello, WTMB. And then it's going to say, hello, WTMB. This is a second listener. So multiple handlers, we call them event handlers, can actually handle the same event, can be um, aware of the same event. All right, there was a click event. And whoever is interested in that click event can be notified of that event with something we call a what? With a function, with a special function, there's a special name. What is the name? Callback function. Yes. That's why I was mentioning, you know, it's calling us back. It's literally a callback function. This is the event, and I'm passing in a callback function. I'm telling the computer, the browser, hey, whenever this event occurs, call me back. And it does call me back. It also called back the first one that I wrote. So it's like, it's almost like registering um, to have phone calls. And the operator is, you know, one by one, having everybody a chance to, to speak on the phone. So it first called back the first um, callback function, which was, oh, which was this. And then it did the second callback function. Um, is everything clear so far? Any? Any questions? If so, you can raise your hands. I can answer it. Or we have a lot of TAs that are bored that are playing with their phones on the back. So we can actually put them to good use. Um, all right. Again, this is the, the essentials of asynchronous programming. Now, you might wonder, how are we going to use this? We're not doing front end yet. We're going to do it on the seventh week. How are we going to use this? Um, Raise your hands and give me an example of how we can use this functionality in the code that we have written so far. Please. But we don't have a user interface right now. There, there's no place that the user can click right now, as of now. So I'm asking for an example from the existing code that we wrote. Please. Maybe if a new person is created or attends a meetup. Meetup print names can be called automatically. Yes. Um, but that would be right now sort of a synchronous operation. When there's a new person attending a meetup, just call their names automatically. Um, but yeah, there are actually event based systems that does that, of course. Any other answer? Maybe when we try to know the state, and for this account, it's pretty big, and it could be. Perfect. Yeah, this is a, this is a great answer. Um, imagine your Facebook, all right? Imagine somebody is trying to access their database of users, or let's say your meetup, meetup.com. And somebody is trying to get the names of the attendees to a meetup that, that's organized. And that, you know, your database is millions of events, hundreds of millions of users, right? Loading that database might take some time. Or saving to that database might take some time. 
Right now, what we do is, if this file is very, very big, what we do is we just wait because everything is synchronous. If you go to the database, in fact, here's a tip for you. We're using write file sync and we're using read file sync. These two functions here are in the name synchronous. So if these files are big, if you have a huge database, you cannot do anything. You'll have to wait until we read that. You cannot even parse a second request. You cannot even have a second request until we load the entire database. That's going to take a lot of time. And that's going to block our users from accessing our functionality. Right? It's not that it's taking a lot of CPU or resources. So actually, our server could have multiple users. Maybe somebody doesn't want to do anything with the database. Maybe somebody just, I don't know, wants to um, register to a smaller database or just get some information that is in the memory, not even save a, um, a person or a meetup. They just want to see the meetup page. I don't know, just making these up. You cannot serve them. You have to wait until that first person is done with their service, and then you can go on, which is really not useful. That's why these synchronous operations are extra. The originals of these functions are asynchronous. Because JavaScript, and especially Node.js, is non-blocking. None of the actions that you do in Node.js are actually blocking a user from doing something. Especially in this case, when we're reading a file or writing a file, because we are actually asking the operating system, either Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, to do these operations for us. We tell the operating system, hey, can you please load this file? We give it the path where the file is located. And then it's, you know, it's saying, OK, I'm going to process this information. I'm going to read that file out of the hard disk, and I'm going to call you back. Now, if you do it synchronously, your program does nothing. It's just waiting for the operating system to complete, which is not a great way of building programs. That's why all of these operations are actually happening asynchronously. And what we do is we tell the operating system here when we do write file or read file, hey, please deal with this file, either read it or write to it, and let me know when you're done. In the meantime, I'm going to do something else, because why should I wait? There is no reason for me to wait. And Node.js is smart enough to listen to that file read event from the operating system or file write event from the operating system. Okay? Internally, Node.js is asking the file system to read that file, registers an event handler, much like we did with the hello message. And then, you know, when, there is, um, the, when this functionality is complete, that handler is called. Do I make any sense? Is it confusing? A little bit? Maybe. The issue is servers are cheap. We can have multiple of them, and we will have uh, multiple servers. But we cannot have as many servers as our clients. If we have a million users using our web pages, we cannot have a million servers. We can have maybe one or two. Maybe if you're very rich, um, how many servers did Facebook have? One million? Mark was talking about it. Um, they have a lot of servers. Um, I mean, Wayfair has about 20,000 servers, very powerful ones. And we have millions and millions of customers. But you, know, you cannot really have millions or billions of, of servers. So what you have to do is each server has to serve multiple users. But if they, all of them want to access a very heavy resource, like reading a file from a database. That's not going to work. What can happen there is we take the orders, almost as in, a, in a restaurant, we take the orders and say, we're going to bring your food whenever it's ready. And then we go back to the kitchen, ask a couple of chefs for preparing that food. And when that food is ready, we take it back to the, um, to the clients. right? To the customers. This is exactly how it's working with servers and databases. Actually, the terminology is the same. We have servers that are serving the, the customers. It's literally the same. Um, so 
that's why all of these operations are asynchronous. When we are accessing the database, a real database, it's going to be an asynchronous operation. We have one single database. Think of it like one kitchen. And we have a couple of servers, but millions of customers. And they will be waiting in the queue to be served. And we need that freedom to serve other customers. Again, think of, think of the, the restaurant. If you, if you had one server and also zero chefs, so that's, that server has to um, go back to the kitchen and also cook. Who's going to take the orders of the second table? They have to wait until the meal of the first customer is ready, right? That's very stupid. That's why you have a couple of servers, um, so that at least the customers can tell you what they want. Um, otherwise, it would be very slow, right? And obviously, did anybody work at a restaurant in a kitchen? Yeah, a couple of people. Obviously, you know that some food is already ready there. Maybe you just warm it up. Maybe you um, cook it a little bit more. But most of the base is already ready. So it takes a very short time to prepare food for every customer. Otherwise, you would go out of business. It wouldn't actually make any sense if you could make only one meal for 30 minutes. Um, your customers would be waiting. Does it clarify why we need asynchronous programming? We need multiple servers. Even if we have one kitchen, we need multiple servers to be able to serve multiple customers. Um, they're going to wait. Everybody is going to wait anyway. But they want to be able to tell you the orders. Uh, all right. So I removed the, the sync from these names, write file and read file. Should it work? Raise your hands if you say this is going to work asynchronously. There. Anyone else? There. It should work, right? Let's see. What are we doing here? Um, OK, let's. Oh, OK, we have, we're loading the database. And we're adding a merge. All right, this is good. Let's run it. I get an error. Unexpected token U in JSON at position zero. Why is that? Here. Unexpected token U in JSON at position. Let's see. OK, this should work. No, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Anybody? No idea? Great, I'm going to give you the answer, and then we're going to take a break for you to digest it. <laughs> um, the reason is actually very straightforward. I removed the, the name sync, but it has to have um, a price, right? You cannot just change the program and expect it to work. We made something that's synchronous asynchronous. So let's talk about the load function. That's what I'm, I'm using here. I said F previously it was fs read file sync. And just to prove that it works, let's run this. It's working, OK? So I'm not making it up. It's actually working. Um, and I remove the sync, it's throwing an error. Why? Because I'm still trying to parse the return value of read file. OK? However, read file is an asynchronous operation right now. So it doesn't actually return anything synchronously. It doesn't return anything. If you remember the click operation that we did in the browser, we had document at event listener, right? And then we passed in what? We had something else there to listen to the events. A callback. Yeah, we passed in a callback function in, in the click handler. Right? If we go back to the browser here, we passed in hello world WTMB. And when you click it, you're notified. So we need this handler or listener 
in the read file event as well. Because right now what we're telling to the file system, this FS stands for file system, what we're doing is, hey, can you please read this file for me? And then just let me know when you're done. That part is missing here. We, we didn't actually give it a phone number that it can call us back on, all right? Uh, and I'm, I need to add that functionality here, okay? And if I do it, then it's going to work. So for that, imagine in this read file, I'm passing in a function. Let's say file for now. And then I need to do my operation here. This is the event handler. This line nine will be called when that file is read. So I, I actually cannot return anything. I have to move this JSON parse from here. I'm deleting it, deleting the JSON parse from there, because there is no JSON there yet. The file wasn't read yet. The file will be read here. JSON parse file. Now I have the file. What am I going to do with it? Currently, is this code event-driven when you load the database on line three? No, right? It's still synchronous. It's giving the command to load the file and is immediately expecting a response. But that event is happening asynchronously. When you're on line nine, you know, after a couple of seconds, there is no way to go back to that line three. So we need another callback function for the load function. All right, I need to add a callback here, callback, which is a function. And then, and only then, I'm calling that callback function. Now I'm expecting it a function here, and which means that I have to provide a function, which is here, file, and let's say loaded file, because that was our name, right? Now, let's see. Let's see what happens here. OK, before I run this code, I'm going to add something to this callback function. Um, in Node.js, there is a standard way of passing errors. So, you know, the world burned, the hard disk burned, there's an error, you cannot read the file, the file doesn't exist. You need to let the program know that there has been an error, right? And the way to do that is actually to add a first parameter called error to every callback function. So every callback function in Node.js, by definition, you don't have to do it, but uh, everybody does it, requires error as the first parameter, which will be null, which means no value, um, when, there's, when there are no errors, and then the actual um, content, the actual parameter, all right? So that's also what I'm going to do here. I'm going to be passing in the error and adding in the error here, and then the loaded file. Now let's run this. I'm going to be debugging this line by line. All right. Let's clear the console. Debug this. So I pass over the first line. I require the database. Come on. Go away. The second line, I require meetup. The third line, database load. Let's put breakpoints everywhere and see what is happening. And I'm just going to execute the next line. Which line will execute first? Tell me. Which line where? Is it line four on the left, line six on the left, line eight, or line nine? Raise your hands. Please. Eight will execute first. Here? OK. What is the next one to execute? After eight, is it line nine? 
four, or six here? It's tricky. What? Six on the left. Why? <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm pushing too far. All right. <laughs> um, let's see. I have breakpoints everywhere, so everywhere it goes, I should be uh, able to catch it. When I hit next, line eight will execute, of course, because that is where the load function is. That's synchronous. Okay. Now, any bets? What is the next one? Raise your hands if you think it's going to be line nine here on the right. One, two. Okay. Is it going to be line four on the left? Raise your hands if you think it's going to be line four on the left, the next line. One. Okay. Line six on the left. Raise your hands if you think it's line six. A lot of people. All right. The rest is undecided. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's run it. It's line six on the left. The reason is because here on line eight, we told the operating system to start reading that file. In our synchronous operation, sequence of operations, we loaded the, um, the database and meetup files, and we asked the database to load meetup JSON. It came here. We were still synchronous. We asked here to the operating system to load that file, and then let us know whenever you read that file. And this is an asynchronous operation, which means we, you know, deferred that concern to the future, and the operating operating system promised us that it will get back to us. Okay, and then we're going on with our execution because we didn't run out of code yet. We have a lot of other code to execute. So this was a synchronous line um, on line eight. After executing it and making that asynchronous call, we are going forward with the next synchronous operation. And that is actually requiring the person class. Which line will come next? Line three. So is it line three, four, eight on the left, or line nine on the right? Line nine on the right. OK, let's see. OK, it's line eight on the left. Why? Please. Exactly. Yes. All the, all the code on the left is currently synchronous. So, in fact, now the operating system obviously already read the file, right? I've been holding this for like five minutes now. Of course, the operating system read the file. But it cannot go and disturb my execution because I'm still working on, on executing that file first. I have a lot of synchronous operations lined up. I have to first finish them, and then I can take more calls from the operating system. The operating system is currently trying to ping me you know, every millisecond and say, hey, like, when are you going to eat the, the food that I cooked for you, the, the order that I prepared for you? When are you going to consume the, uh, the file? And I'm like, wait, like, I cannot do it right now. I have other synchronous operations to, to build here. So I will first go through, oops, <laughs> OK, what happened? There was an error. Loaded file is not defined. Of course, it's not defined. There was an error on line 8 because there is no, um, there's no object called loaded file. So it crashed. What happened to the file that I read? Nobody knows. It went away. Like it was for nothing. It was useless. Um, all right, let's remove these. Let's say, 
you know, we don't pass in anything and this should work. Line three, line eight on the right, line six here. When I run this, ah, uh, why? Ah, uh, I have to pass in at least an, an empty object. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, line eight. Again, run it, line six. Next line is eight. Yeah, okay. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and we print the names. We didn't even print the attendee names, right? When I run it, oh, sorry, we printed the attendee names and then we printed the, um, the meetup name. And then after I finished the execution of all of these lines, including line 11, which gave us this, and line 12, which gave us this, only then I can go back to line nine. Only then the operating system can tell me, well, I've done my part. I read the file. Now do whatever you want to do, right? And when I run this, now I end up on line four on the left because I read the file. And of course, I'm just going to print hello right now. That's, that wasn't very useful. Let's also print the loaded file. OK. Now when I run it, see what happens. I'm going line three, line eight on the right, coming back to line six on the left, going through all of these lines, and having the callback. And when I hit continue, I end up at line four. Now, and only now I could read the file. And when I run it, I see hello, and there's the object, uh, we'll take Makers Berlin. This is the, the file that I loaded. This is the database that I loaded. Does it make any sense? Okay. Um, now, the last thing that I'm gonna do before the break is I'm going to put these lines in that function, in the callback function. Let's put them inside the callback function. Let's carry the, the person here and run this. OK. Now there is a callback on line 9. And now I have hello. And now I'm creating the meetup instance from the database. I'm creating Umur right now. Umur is attending the meetup. We're printing attendee names. And now you see the, the rest of the names. Now you see Arman and Mert and Umur. Why? Because now we were able to load the file. We moved the operations from uh, outside the callback function into the callback function. Before this, I was executing these lines right after the call to the operating system to read the file, but before it could actually tell us that it was able to read the file. Now what I'm doing is I move these into the callback function. And what it does, again, after the operating system tells me that it was able to load the files, I'm creating my instances and making this work. As a proof, I could log here, am I the last operation? And when I run this, you're going to see that it's not the last operation, right? It's actually one of the first operations. And then the file is read. And then I'm coming to hello. And then the rest of the stuff happens. So this is event driven programming. There was an event in the operating system that the file was read. OK. And then I said, OK, if you read the file, now create a meetup out of it. Then create a person. That person will attend the meetup and then print the names and the name of the meetup. But only after I receive that event. I receive that event from the operating system. OK. Now we're going to have a 10 minute break, 15 minute break. Um, please enjoy the food and the beer and the drinks. We have a lot in the back. The beer um, is in the fridge. And we're going to be here for the rest of the class. And if you have any questions in the meantime, we're all free. The teaching assistants are on the back. So please let us know.
and we can answer your questions. Are you in Google Tech Makers version Slack? Okay. So here is the the the, um, the channel. So if you're in WTM Berlin, um, Slack, you can just join this JS Crash Course channel. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So click plus, and there. Oh wait, sorry. It's it's for. Yeah. Um. How do I click channels? Yeah. Now you can type J S. And there it is. No problem. Okay. Ah, okay. Hi. Yes, um, there is a debug menu um, that you can click start debugging. If your Mac has the touch bar, there is also the, the debug button here. Ah, OK. So then that's what you do. Either on this menu, there's debug, start debugging. So the, the oh, you just click there. No, you can you can click them wherever whenever you want, and then you do, yeah, and then you do click start debugging, and then it's gonna stop there. And here you can say go to next line, next line, next line. It ends up there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. No problem. Hi. I hope, if I have time, we'll see. <laughs> no promises. <laughs> Not very deep, because like there's no end to it. Yeah. There are like operating system events like SIGINT, SIGHUB, yeah. um, SIGTERM. Yeah. All of them are different. And then you probably also want to log these to a remote server. Like there's so much to yeah. learn about error handling. Yeah, like I'm some like, uh, stuff about like that's really one of the things that are very useful in um, yeah. in general. Like yeah. you know when when do you decide to throw an error? It's not a nice topic to talk about. Yeah, but it's super important. <laughs> yes, but also debugging. For example, nobody's talking about debugging, but it's yeah. also extremely important. Yeah, no, actually, um, it's have the skill. Yeah, so that's what we said in the first lecture. Uh, we, in the second lecture, we started with debugging. We started talking about how to run the debugger, how to yeah. put the breakpoints. That's why I didn't talk about them, because the class kind of already knows. Yeah. Um, and error handling is actually one of those. Last year, we had a nice discussion because somebody asked, what happens if the program crashes before that callback executes? And then I was able to go into much more detail. Yeah. Um, but right now, the level is a little bit different. Right. So I just you know, shamelessly plugged in the error yeah. here. Um, when I do the promises thing, I will briefly delete the file and see that in a minute. Yeah. I hope. If I will have time for it. Okay. Like, I'm constantly adjusting the, the contents, yeah. uh, depending on how many people understand it. Do you, do you know any good resources on like error handling strategies? <laughs> no. 
what we can talk about is boring. Well, I mean, if you picked up the topic, like yeah, you know, uh, we can talk about it on Slack. Oh yeah, if you're on, on the server Slack. Uh yeah, it could, it could, but uh, yeah, would you even do like a private class or something? I can. Or even like a class if you'd like or, to pay the hourly rate or like, or like. I mean, um, I'm, I'm I'm actually doing those kind of events. Yeah. Um, like on demand. Yeah. Um, but that would be like. A not really. Uh, I mean, we can talk if you are really interested in it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm now like a uh, Okay. And it's maybe one of the topics that I really feel like uh, second year. Yeah. But no. Uh, yeah. I don't know. But we we'll can talk. talk. Um, I'm going to send you, if you write to me on Slack, I can send you some relevant links to my web pages. Um, and then okay. yeah. you are really interested in okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Hi. Really? Tells you. Where? <laughs> um, was that at the bottom of the screen where it was? Yeah, here. Where it was like, where it's here. Like, no, it's it's actually in the output. So let's see. For example, here, you see when I ran it, it actually showed me the the problem here, and it tells you like it's on database JS line eight, and then you go to line eight, and it's actually even telling you the character like character 15, I don't know where it is, I think it's maybe here. Um, and then it, yeah. This is called a stack trace, yeah, no problem. This is a, called a stack trace. It is basically all the functions that were executed until you had that error in reverse order. So we were on index.js first, it was line three, obviously this is not this code, we changed it. On line three we were doing database load before. This is the error. This is unexpected token U in JSON position zero is the error. This is where the error came from. So I know where the error came from. It came from index.js line three. And then index.js, huh? It's telling me, see, here. These are the lines that were executed. Yeah. So this is in reverse order. This was the first ever thing that was executed, startup. These are inside Node.js. I'm not interested in all of these. Um, I'm interested in the, in the files that I wrote. So this entire thing, this thing here, is the problem definition. Sorry? Yeah. So, yeah, so what you do is you ignore, so these are the file names, right? They end with .js. These are the file names, bootstrap, node.js, module.js. You ignore the files that you don't know. Then you're interested in the files that you know. See, this is my computer projects called GitHub WTM Berlin JSCC 2019 index.js. This is something I wrote. And it shows me that this executed index.js file line three, and then it executed database.js file line eight, which means this line, line three, was calling line eight in database.js. Yeah. Okay, so if you're just visualize scanning, okay, how is it out of all of this? Yeah. 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 And then this database.js.8 was calling this line. That was the JSON parse here. That gave the error. Yeah. Yes. 
you, and then you know you Google this and learn what it is or why it is there. No. Depending on different areas, you're gonna see different messages here. Water, maybe. Turn down the lights. I think we can. Yeah, no, we can only do. We can only turn up all of them, but we can turn them down a little bit. That's actually what we did before, uh, because they are adjustable. Um, you see the, the switch there. Maybe you can try it out. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, we call it path arrow. That's a function declaration. So these are the parameters. We say this function is taking these parameters and returning whatever is in here. So this is actually the same as typing function and removing this. Basically the same. Is it more clear now? The name of is the name of a parameter that I'm receiving, which is actually this function over here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can clarify that one again. <laughs> so I'm defining the actual callback function here. Okay. I'm passing it as a parameter to the load function. Yeah, so this this is the function that I'm creating. What? Don't freak out. Everything is under control. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which takes two parameters. One is the file name is meetup.json. And the callback is a function to check for this. Is a function which is this entire thing. Oh, I see. Okay, so that could be a variable for me. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm going to start with that one. Okay. Yeah. The last lecture? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Alone. No, you yeah. create an array. Yeah. If you have multiple instances, yeah, 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 you yeah. create an array and then save the array. But then so one one to... file per model. I want... ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, that's actually it. And then I can Yeah, and you do a for each or a map operation and then uh -huh. create um, them one by one. Like and so them. I can Do it afterwards if you like. If you have time after the class, you can wait for me. We can do it then. 
or maybe you can ask a PA, which, but then you would miss the contacts. So, you know, or we can talk about it on Slack. Okay. 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 I'll be here. So, if you have time, we can talk about it afterwards. Hello. Shall we start? It's going to be like 20 minutes in two minutes, so I think we should start. We still have a couple of wraps. If you didn't eat today, you should. Um, I think we have six wraps left. <laughs> Hi. Sure, of course. Will you remind me on Slack? Yeah. All right. Of course, no problem. Class, are you ready? Sort of. Um, there was one person who wanted to dim the lights a little bit. If you want, if you're okay with that, we can do it. Um, the control is over there on the back, so maybe we can dim it a little bit and see if it still works for us. Not that much. A little bit higher, I guess. Yeah, something like this. Maybe we can do the same with the others. Is it okay? Is it enough light? Should I turn it on? You can be vocal with, with everything. Um, we did this to make this more readable. Um, but if you need more light, you can tell us. This one as well? Yeah, it's coming down. Yay. Cool. Is it better? I feel like this is like we're now flying to another continent and they dim the lights because they want us to sleep. <laughs> okay, don't sleep. Whatever is coming up is a lot of content. Um, I'm gonna start with recapping what we did here because I received a couple of questions about it. What is really going on here? What is this callback? What is the callback parameter here? What is this that I put here? So this is this function over here that starts on line 5 and ends with line 13 is what I want to do after I load the database. Okay. It's all the work that I want to do after I load the database. I put it in a function because I want to execute them in one call. You know, the operating system will call me back and say, hey, I actually read the file that you requested. So do whatever you want with it. So I can actually take this out, create a function here. Let's paste it here and say const callback equals function. So I can actually define a function called callback here. It's very similar to the load function, right? And then I pass that in. This callback is now a parameter. This function is now a parameter that will be passed on to the load function and it will be executed after we read the file, okay? I hope this, yeah, let's change the name. We can call it stuff to do after loading the database. 
and I'm passing it to the load function right now. Database.load meetup JSON. And then when you're done, call stuff to do after loading the database. And for the load function, it's still a parameter called callback. And what I'm doing here is I'm calling that callback. I'm calling that callback after I read the file and say, OK, now do whatever you want. We can call this handler. It will still work. So this stuff to do after loading the database is the same as the handler right now. I'm passing around functions. If you're coming from a different language, um, it's very, it might be difficult to get used to the idea that you can pass around functions. Um, especially in static languages, we don't have that. But in JavaScript, you can pass around anything as a parameter. Everything can be a variable. This stuff to do after loading the database is a variable. You can pass it around. You can do whatever you want with it. You can log it. You can delete it. Um, you can change its properties and everything. And we're just passing it to. <laughs> we're passing it to. The load function. As the parameter here, database load meetup JSON is the file name. And stuff to do after loading the database is the handler. And then here on line nine, I'm calling that handler <laughs> with the contents of the file. And the error, if there's an error, right? Let's run this and show that it's working. See, it's working. It's printing the names of the attendees and the meetup name. And let's delete the meetup JSON. I deleted the database. What's going to happen now? Will it work? It should give us an error. See, it gave us an error. It said, unexpected token u in JSON at position 0, something, something. And here is my file with the path. So users, my name, projects, code, GitHub, WC, and Berlin, JSCC 2019, week 2, database JS, line 9. It says there's a problem on line 9, um, character 23. And it is actually here, line 9, character 23 is exactly here, json.parse. There's an error in json parse. It actually tells us, right? At json parse, there's an error. Then there's an unexpected token u in json at position 0. Um, so this is an error. What are we doing with this error? Currently, we're ignoring it. That's why it's dimmed. Let's put a breakpoint here. Um, debug it by clicking Start Debug. Let's run this. And here, Oh, wait, I, I deleted the wrong file. <laughs> OK, it was able to read the file. Which file are you? Where are you, database? Meet up, Jason. Ah, here. Here you are. OK. Let's run this again. Run, run, run. run and okay let's try it here I still have? no or we yep cool so here i deleted the file what you see here is an error the error parameter on the right says error and no end no such file or directory open meetup.json because I deleted the file. There is no file anymore. When I run this, um, 
in the debug console, obviously the, the file is undefined, so I'm not seeing anything, and I'm not seeing the error, because I'm not handling it. What I should do in every program is to handle the errors. If there's an error, for example, I can log that error. Hey, an error occurred, and let's log the error. Let's see if it's going to stop here. OK. Let's run it. And it didn't, because it's throwing a, another error here. So what happens here right now is I'm reading, I'm trying to read the file. There is no file. There is an error. And despite having that error, I'm still trying to parse that file, which obviously doesn't work. Like, if there's an error, you shouldn't try to parse it. So error handling actually goes in this callback as well. If there's an error, you should log. There is a read error and log the error. And then call the handler with the error, right? And then return, because the execution ended. If there is no error, then you should call the handler. Right now, there are no errors. So you can say, we're passing in null as the error. And then we're going on. Let's run this again. Read file. And see, I received there is a read error, no such file or directory. Here as well, now I am seeing that error. Hey, an error occurred. And then um, you know, the execution will fail, because right now the loaded file is undefined. There is nothing I can do here anymore. If I go on execution, I'm going to get either more errors or wrong results. In this case, I got name of undefined or null, something weird. So here as well, I should return after handling the error, which will you know, say, OK, I failed. My, my program failed. There's an error. There's a new error called NONT that is an error you get when there's no file to read, when there's no file to write, no such file or directory. Um, so the idea is you, you will have a lot of errors when you're doing asynchronous programming, and you should be handling them. And this is the way to handle them with callbacks. If there's an error, log it, do something else, whatever you want to do with it. Try to fix it, maybe. Um, for example, if there's no file to read from it, we can first create that file. Um, and actually, I have an example for that. And then pass that error on to your callback functions so that whoever asked you to do the operation also knows about that error. And here, you know, in stuff to do after loading the database, I'm handling that error uh, because there's an, there's an error occurred, and now I'm logging it to the console. So as a developer, when you put your software on a server, it's going to run independently. There's going to be a lot of errors, and you won't be knowing about them until after a customer calls your customer service, and then an angry customer service um, employee messages you, or even worse, comes to your desk and says, hey, this isn't working on our web page. Something is wrong. And then you're going to go back and look at these logs on your server and see where the errors are. So it's super important to log these all the errors that you are receiving so that in the future, people can debug your applications. Okay? So don't forget to uh, keep a log of your errors that are generated um, in your applications. All right? Please. Um, why do I have something in the code indicating there's a problem? Isn't that redundant? Yeah. Um, if there, there are no errors, this is the happy path. So this is where the normal execution will go. And now if I actually put that meetup JSON back in, you're going to see that, um, let's create that file again, meetup. That JSON. Oh, okay. It should be an empty array now. So 
Wait, that wasn't an array. That should have been an object. So now the file is there, and it's going to run. Let's see. We're trying to read the file, right? Um, will it stay here? It checks if, um, OK. It goes on with the execution. Callback function exec is executed. Is there an error? There are no errors, because we were able to read the file. Then we're going to go to the happy path, because there are no errors. And then when I go into this function, now I ended up at stuff to do after loading the database. Is there an error? No, there are no errors. Then I'm moving on. Then I'm printing hello and um, creating the, the meetup and uh, having Umur attend that meetup, right? And then I'm printing the attendee names and logging the meetup name um, and finishing the execution. So the happy path obviously has to be there. Do I make any sense? No. OK. Yes. Yeah. Because some per um, wait. If I don't have this, it won't work. This is only error handling. The first if is only error handling. I have to have this in order to make it work. Why do I need the first one? You can argue that I write the perfect code and I never need the error handling, but you never know what will happen. Some um, some people might be careless and delete that file from your system. And your code would start failing um, on its own, and you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know who deleted that. that. This actually happened a couple of times in huge companies. People delete databases of millions of records just you know, out of carelessness. They, they just don't know. They shouldn't have access to delete databases, but they do, because we're human beings. And you, if you don't have error handling in your code, you won't know what's going wrong. Please. Um, because the developer of this file is different than the developer of this file. The developer of this file wants to know if there are any errors that's coming from the operating system. The developer of this file wants to know if there are any errors coming from the database. There are two different teams. Probably this was developed last year, and we're just adding new functionality. And we want to make sure. Um, the more error handling you write, the better you are um, in knowing where the errors and, and the problems are. Exactly. Always handle the errors first. Yeah, if your function doesn't work, you need to break it. We call it also early returns, early exits. And in fact, to make it more simpler, you don't have to have the else here, right? You can just do this. Because if there is an error, if there is any error, we're going to return and we're going to finish the execution there. If not, we're going to continue. This is basically the same thing as as the first code. So this is a little bit easier to read. You know, when you see an if error at the beginning of a callback function, you know that it's error handling. You trace it visually. You scan for the, the next closing curly brackets. And then when you see it, you know that the error handling is done. And you can now operate normally um, and execute your function. Does that make sense? All right, let's move on with asynchronous programming. Callback functions are only one way of building um, asynchronous applications in JavaScript. There are actually two other ways that, I, that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and for that, I'm going to switch to another exercise that hopefully you cloned. It's week three asynchronous file read. What I have there is I have, and if you don't have it, don't worry. It's fine. It's um, on our GitHub repo. If you have it, it's OK. If you don't, you can um, follow up later. I have three files there, one, two, and three. And you see the contents are erste, zweite, and dritte. Now, <laughs> I this is pretty much the extent of my German. 
I'm very ashamed to announce that I created these three files two years ago. <laughs> that was the extent of my German three years ago. Uh, sorry, two years ago. This is still the extent of my German after two years. Um, I don't feel well about it. I'm not a good student in learning languages. Um, I know about 15 different programming languages, but only English as a, as a second human language. Um, so, you know, I wanted to showcase. I actually have an open source library called Erste. That was the first open source library that I wrote after I moved to Germany. That's how I'm attached to these words, because I know how to count. <laughs> and I want to showcase it at wherever I, I go. OK, so what I'm going to do here is, in these lines, I'm starting with reading them synchronously. OK, what you expect here is these will, this will log erste, zweite, und dritte. Oh, I said und. <laughs> It will log erste, zweite, and dritte in order, right? Because these are synchronous operations. In fact, let's do it. I'm going to be running in the debug mode. So this line executes. I'm clicking on this skip line or step, whatever it's called, step to next line, step over. Um, so we log erste, we read the second file, the operating system made us wait for it. And if this were a huge file, we would have waited a couple of seconds. We read it, zweite, we read the third file, dritte, and it works. Now, in order to read these files in order with callbacks, this is pretty much what we did with the database, right? We have read file instead of read file sync, and we have a callback function. We have a callback function that receives the contents of those files and then logs them. What is the next line that's going to execute when I hit run? Tell me. Let's do process exit. Let's comment out these things. So the first line that executes is this fs read file. What is the next line? Will it be 34 or what? 25, 26? Raise your hands, anybody, please. 34. Anyone else? 34. Any other ideas? OK, two men thinks it's 34. <laughs> Anyone else within? Yeah. Is it going to be 34? OK. More people are agreeing on 34. Raise your hands if you agree with 34. OK. Um, I tricked you because I'm going to ask you now why. <laughs> because when I ask this, nobody raises their hands to answer. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay, can you tell me why it why would it be 34 and not 25 for example? Anything you can say is fine. There are no wrong answers. Any answers? Okay. How about you? Exactly. This is working asynchronously right now. The read file calls are asynchronous. It's not read file sync. Be careful. It's read file. Um, so it's, it's telling the operating system to read that file and call us back. And while the operating system is working on reading the file, what we're going to do is we're going to finish what's coming after this, the, the synchronous operations. So there's another synchronous operation here. That's process.exit. And that's what I'm going to execute next. So if I hit step over, I'm going to do 34, and it's going to quit. Because you know, I exited the, the process. 
I didn't have a chance to read the files. I didn't give a chance to the operating system to call me back. I literally cut the line. Um, so let's comment up these bits and remove this process exit. Let's say console log am I first? Of course, or not, we know that. Oh, wait, we know that you are first. And then you have Arste, Zweite, and Dritte. OK? How does it look? And there are no error handling here. Imagine you also have error handling. How does it look, the code? Is it familiar? Did you like it? Do you like how it looks? Is there a pattern here? What would happen if I had 10 different files, if I wanted to read them in order? It's not readable, right? It's going in and in and in with every asynchronous operation. In a regular web page, you have tens of different asynchronous operations. It's a little bit difficult to read, to consume. So when you're here, on line 29, you're logging console log um, content three. What you usually do is you read these files and then log them here, right? And now imagine we are doing 100 different operations. Where is contents two coming from or contents three coming from? It's a little bit difficult to, to trace. Everything is happening asynchronously. And in order to have them working in order, we have to see it's going to work, of course. We have to have this indentation. We call this the callback hell because it's like infinitely growing. You have like 10 levels of indentation for 10 different asynchronous operations. It's a hell for developers, for JavaScript developers. So we don't like this at all. And this was how we worked until, I don't know, 2013, 14 around that time. Um, I developed code with this for almost 15 years. That wasn't the best time of my life. <laughs> and then people invented new ways of doing it. And you're actually very lucky. We have much better ways of doing this right now. And I'm going to be talking about that in a second. But before that, in order to prove a point, I will take this apart. I will take out these console logs um, or read files. So uh, what is the first line that will be executed when I run this? Anybody? The first line that will be executed when I run this. Please raise your hands. What? Line number one. Yeah, what is the second line? <laughs> That's going to be executed. <laughs> Raise your hands. 24. All right. What is the third line that's going to be executed? I hear 28. Higher. Anyone else? 36. Good. What else? It's either 28 or 36, right? Let's run it. The first line is this. The second line is 28. The third line is 32. The fourth line is 36, because these are all synchronous operations right now. I'm doing read file, file one. You see there are no logs yet. And I'm, doing, I'm continuing on doing synchronous operations. I'm telling the operating system to read the first file. Then I'm telling the operating system to read the second file and the third file. But all of these are synchronous. I didn't give a chance to the operating system to call me back yet. I'm still blocking the line. And then I'm logging console log I'm, uh, am I first. And then if I put breakpoints here, now here's the important tricky bit. Tell me which line will execute first. No. <laughs> You ruined all the fun. Don't do this. <laughs> right? I'm sure you didn't hear. 
Tell me. <laughs> Tell me which line will execute first. 25? Why? Perfect. It was the first one that we requested. So obviously 25 will load first. Do you agree? Raise your hands if you agree. A couple of people here. Why don't why don't you agree? That did you hear the guy over there? Um, yeah, that's what you expect, right? Uh, it's an asynchronous operation, but that was the first one that we requested, so that should be the first one to execute. I run it, and yeah, I was actually lucky. Erste, zweite, dritte, those executed in order. Let's run it a couple of more times. This time it was zweite, dritte, and erste. So the order changed. Let's run it again. This time it's dritte, erste, zweite. The order changed. Run it again. Erste, zweite, dritte. Different. Run it again. Erste, zweite, dritte. The same. Dritte, zweite, erste. Different order. Now raise your hands and tell me why this could be happening. I'm not looking there. <laughs> No. Anyone else? Tell me. Raise your hands, please. Cool. Dirita was the last one before, so maybe it's in memory. Um, that could be how the operating system implemented it. We don't know. Um, the reason these are happening randomly is because we're not in control. The operating system reads these files whenever it wants. And if it's in memory, maybe it will load faster. If it's not in memory, maybe it will load slower because it's reading from the disk. Maybe it's always reading from the disk. I don't know. It's probably always reading from the disk. Um, and then, you know, the disk is a flash disk. The access times are different, um, and they are random. Do you know what RAM stands for? It's random access memory. Literally, the access to the memory is random. In, in today's disks as well, the access time is random. So you don't know. You don't know which one you will get first. You register them. You say, I want the first, the second, and third file in order. And then they end up randomly calling you back. So that's why this code won't run. That's why we have to put them in a callback hell to guarantee that they are in order. Now we say after reading line, um, after reading the first file, then read the second line. After you are finished reading the second file, then read the, uh, the third file. After you are finished reading the third file, then log the contents. Now I ensure the, um, the order. So if you run this multiple times, you're going to get the, the same order. And my first is always first because it's synchronous. Erste, zweite, dritte. You know, you can run it a million times. You're going to end up with the same order. So the only way to achieve order is to create chaos with the callback help. Come on, that was a good line. <laughs> right? Um, are there any anarchists here? No? Yeah. <laughs> OK, um, but we all agree this looks terrible. We need a better way to make this work. And there comes the concept of promises. Raise your hands if you heard of promises in JavaScript or futures in other languages. It could be C Sharp. It could be, I don't know, any other language. OK, so um, a promise is a construct is a contract that you sign that you're going to do something in the future, right? If I promise to come to our wedding, it means I will probably skip it. <laughs> no, it means that I'm, you know, I'm going to prepare for it and come to our wedding on your uh, wedding day, hopefully. Um, if I promise to pay my rent to my landlord, I say, you know, on this date, I'm going to send the money transfer to you. 
until that date, I'm not going to do anything. For example, um, I have an automatic payment at every, I don't know, last week of, of the week, my bank pays out my rent automatically. I'm not doing anything for it. I set um, a command that will run in fixed intervals of a month that will send out the same salary, um, the same rent. And, you know, you delegate that responsibility to something else, to your bank, or in this case, Node.js. You say, I promise to do this for you. And then, you know, you don't have to call back, of course. You can ignore it. Um, you can skip it. But what you usually do is you go back and say, well, yeah, I did the payment or I read your file and here is its contents. But that will happen in the future, right? This is how we do asynchronous programming in JavaScript. Um, callbacks were the first one. And to make it a little bit more readable, we're introducing a new concept called promises, which wraps these callbacks or these asynchronous operations um, and then returns a promise. So as a user of that promise, I'm going to show you the API. It's very simple, very straightforward. As a user of that promise, you can say, OK, I will read this file, and then I'm going to do something else. You know, I'm, I'm going to say, I will read the first file, and then I'm going to read the second file, and then I'm going to read the first file. When that promise is fulfilled that's, um, or resolved, those are the terminologies that you need to remember. So a promise is created, and then it's either resolved or rejected, or fulfilled or rejected uh, with an error. OK. How am I going to do that? Let me introduce a new function to read the file. I'm going to comment this out. Let me introduce a new function, read file. What this does is it receives a parameter called file name. Right now, it doesn't receive any callback functions. Because it's going to return you a promise. And then you, know, you will take that promise in. And I will fulfill that promise in the future. I will resolve that promise in the future. And then I will let you know when that happens. So what we do here is we are returning a new promise. That actually takes a callback function that has a resolve and reject as parameters. These are two functions that I can call when I'm done. If there's an error, I have to reject the promise. I have to say, well, sorry, I cannot fulfill your promise. I don't have any money in the bank, for example. There's an error in your bank account. Or if it's successful, I'm resolving that promise. Okay. If the operation is successful, in this case, I'm reading the file contents. If the operation is successful, I'm saying, OK, I got the file contents that you were asking for, and I'm resolving this promise right now. I'm finishing with this work. Okay? And when I resolve that promise is when the execution will continue. Now, how do I work with this? This is the syntax to work with promises. You first say, read file and ask for the, the file name. Of course, you give it the file name. And then you console log. Okay, And then you read the second file. And then you console log. And then you read the third file. And then you console log. It kind of reads nicely. Like the syntax is a little bit weird with these arrow functions. Um, you could also turn these into arrow functions like this, contents, console log contents. It's basically the same thing. But this would be a little bit harder to read. That's why I removed them. You know, this is the same thing. Read the file, then you will receive the contents. This is a function, callback function print the contents, then read the second file. This has to be a function, unfortunately. 
read the second file, then print the contents. Read the third file, then print the contents. Now it reads a little bit better than this callback hell here because there is no indentation um, that's going in and in and in every time you need to read um, a new file. It's like do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. Is it? Let's go back to this version, which is a little bit more simpler, and let's run this, All right? And you're going to see Arste, Zweite, and Dritte as a result. However many times you run it, you're always going to see them in the same order. Yes, yes. A promise doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a result in the end. Like every other promise in the world, there is a chance that I will not be able to fulfill that promise. Um, in that case, you have to catch that error. If you're familiar with the concept of try-catch blocks, this is exactly what it is. This is exactly um, that functionality. What we do is we are trying to read our files, and if there are any errors while we're trying to do that, you know, maybe the second file isn't there. Maybe the operating system kind of crashed while trying to read the file. The file was there, but the operating system crashed. We're going to get an error at the end where we say, OK, catch this error for me. And we also give it a, um, a callback function. And in this case, I'm just logging that error. In fact, I could even remove this parameter here and also say console log there. I'm also logging there. Now, this isn't very useful. Like, I'm logging the contents, and then I'm logging the error. Probably, in a real-life application, you do something else with the error. For example, you call people um, at night, the engineers who are working on your code to maintain your code. You call them at night and tell them, hey, there's an error. Look into this. Um, so usually, this catch function is a little bit bigger. But for practical purposes, we can say, like, this is also going to work. Because console log is a function. It, prints whatever you give to it. Um, does it read better? Great. Um, the question is, is one catch enough, or should I use multiple catches? What happens if there's an error in the second um, promise? How do I know it's coming from the second promise? Um, you sh you can use multiple catches, but if it's a um, almost like a synchronous operation, like do this and then and then and then, you can have only one, and hopefully the errors will be clear enough to tell you where it's coming from. Um, for example, in this case, if the file if, if the second file is deleted, we're going to get an NOND error with the file name to the text, so you will know that it's coming from the second line. Um, it is a, obviously, it's a good practice to catch these errors in a read file as well. So, because that's where the errors are coming from, right? On read file. Here, if error, return reject error is a common way of building these things. What should happen here, though, is, yeah, we're going to re return it in the end, but maybe we should log it. There is an error. Now you will exactly know where that error is coming from. And obviously, put the error there as well. You will know where it's coming from, and then you're passing on that error. Whenever there's a chance to log an error, do it. It's good practice. Whenever there's an error parameter, the first thing you should do is to handle that error. The basic thing, the, the easiest thing that you can do is to log it. So that's what we're going to do. But in the future, in a real production application, again, you're going to be sending these errors to other systems to process. OK, and then a final catch is kind of enough to handle these. But this is still not that straightforward. JavaScript is all about being concise, having as little code as possible. And we see a lot of repetition here. For example, we see then, then, then. And it's chained. So you see 
we do read file dot then dot then dot then so we're chaining these calls it's a little bit confusing to get these right especially if some of these promises are promises in their own so they're calling multiple promises what you might end up doing is this so you have this and put a then here and the read file here something like this then it gets very very confusing you know th where is this coming from and here you have another indentation because you are now chaining promises inside promises it's not super straightforward how this is executing um, there are a lot of parentheses that's also freaking me out um, seriously if i see a series of numbers i cannot really count for example if i see one and six zeros i cannot count how many zeros are in there it's impossible the same thing is happening for programming as well if i suit if i see too many parentheses i don't know how to track them which parentheses belongs to what other parentheses there are actually nice tools for ides to color parentheses differently so just at a glance you can see what colors are matching so what parentheses are matching what color um, but i'm not using it and it gets super awkward for me when i have to do this can i select it Yeah, so for example, if you put the cursor here, it shows you that this is matching with that parentheses. But what about its parent? <laughs> what is the one next to it? You know, you have to trace this. It's very difficult. You know, okay, this is the, the last one on line 58 is corresponding to the first one on line 57. And what was it then? What was it coming after? Which promise? That's that gets awkward really quickly. It's best if we can avoid these. Yeah, it's going to be even worse. <laughs> yeah, in real world, we're going to have more code between these parentheses. It might be handled with one method, hopefully, maybe not. Who knows? Um, depending on how much time that developer didn't have to make it look better. But the thing is, we can do better. That's the, the biggest thing I love about JavaScript. The community never stops. We're trying to improve the language as best as we can. So there's no need, please. Tell me again. Do we use promises? Only when we have nested callbacks. No, we should use promises anytime we have asynchronous code. Um, you could argue that whenever we have asynchronous code, we would need callbacks. Um, so the idea is we should almost never use callbacks. OK, I'm very confusing right now. The idea is promises are for asynchronous operations. Whenever you have any asynchronous operation, you should use a promise. Um, there are only a couple of instances where you would need callbacks after starting using promises. And those instances are real event-driven programming. Right now, only I am interested if this file is read, right? I'm the consumer of this. This is not an event, actually. This is just letting me know that the file is read. In the click handler, though, multiple applications could be interested in listening to my clicks. That's a real event then you cannot obviously do it with a, with a promise um, because there will be multiple clicks. There won't be only one click ever. So in that situation, you have to use callbacks, of course, for event handling. And for all the other asynchronous operations, loading from the database, lo loading from a file system, calling another, another API, um, these should all be promises. Or <laughs> as I'm going to show you now, we're going to also not use promises. There is a third one, third construct that we're going to use. And that is called async await. Now, I was saying that this is what I love about JavaScript. We are trying to improve the language um, every single day. We can make this better. We can get rid of this thens and um, these dots and parentheses. 
and make it more simpler and easier to read, still maintaining the same functionality. So about two years or three years ago, there was a new proposal from the JavaScript community to adopt a syntax that C Sharp developers were using. Um, that, and that was async await. They are two keywords that were used in, in C Sharp. And they wanted to bring it over to JavaScript. And we were very skeptical of the idea. But in fact, when you see how it reads, we're like, OK, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. So what you do is you introduce two new keywords, async and await. Async comes before the function declaration and denotes that that function is doing an asynchronous operation, which is great. Just by looking at the function name or the function declaration, you know which functions are executing asynchronously. That's perfect. Within that function, then you can use the await keyword. And those come before function calls. You can say await read file. This indicates that read file is an asynchronous operation where my execution should stop and delegate that to the operating system, whatever. And then I'm going to have the results as content. Okay? And then I move on to the next line and, and next line um, forever. So let's run this. In order to run this, I need to call this function main. Um, or let me show you without the function first, what happens if I just write this. When I run it, I get an error called unexpected identifier. This is a very confusing error. Uh, the issue is Node.js currently doesn't allow you to run await operations or asynchronous operations on the main block, on the module block. It says, put these in a function. Um, the details are very technical, so I won't go into why they do that. They just say, put this in a function. I don't like it lying around like that. That's why we are putting it in, a, um, in an asynchronous function and calling it. It's pretty much the same thing. We're putting it in a function called main and then calling that function. It's doing the same thing. It's just pleasing Node.js and Node.js community. There are a lot of flame wars for why this is happening. You can read more about it online. Uh, I'm not a fan of this decision. I think this is very confusing for people to ask them to use another asynchronous method, uh, asynchronous function, but that's what they decided on. So what we do is we create an asynchronous function main and then call that function, and then this is going to work. So when I run this, you're going to see Arstez, Vita, Dorita. If I put a breakpoint here, you're going to see that these are operating in, well, this is not a file that we wrote, so we don't ha have to care about it. But these are operating in almost like synchronous code, line after line, right? Erste, zweite, dritte. Now, question. When I put console log am I first here, which line will execute first? First, A to two, or um, seventy-one or seventy-two? We have three contenders: seventy-one, seventy-two, and eighty-two. Which line will execute first? Eighty-two, eighty-one. Yeah, eighty-one is the first one. What is the next line? Seventy-one is coming after 81. What is the next one? Is it 72 or 82? They're going to be random. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, OK. Is it 82 or 72? The bets are open. 72. 
82. 72. 72. 72. All right, let's see. So let's run this. Obviously, we have 81 first. That's the main entry. The next line I'm running is 71, right? Because it's still synchronous. The next line I'm running is 82. Why? Who said 72? <laughs> now nobody's admitting it. <laughs> Why? Why didn't it work? So you thought we were synchronizing it by using async and await. That's why um, 72 should have worked. It actually does. It waits until that file is read. Um, yes, but that's still an asynchronous operation. So what happens is, on line 71, I'm telling the program, hey, wait for the operating system to load this, and then resume execution. Until it's loaded, go back and execute all the remaining synchronous calls. That's why it's going to line 82. And you can have as many lines as you want here, um, and they're all going to execute before loading the, the file contents, because this is, an, this is still an asynchronous operation. Now we loaded the first file, and then we're logging it. OK? If you, log the, if you read the second file, there are no remaining synchronous operations. So we're just going to wait. And then we log that file. We read the third one. There are still no other synchronous operations that are remaining, so we're waiting. We're doing nothing until the operating system is done, and then we're executing it, right? And then it's done. So this new syntax, async await, make this look very similar to synchronous code, but still makes it asynchronous, which is a little bit confusing at first, but um, in the long run, it simplifies your coding because you're going to have multiple of these things. Because in certain cases, it literally doesn't make any sense at all to have another synchronous operation. You only rely on reading the first file, the second file, the third file, or doing the first API call, the second API call, the third API call. The responses depend on previous calls all the time. So literally, you can only wait. If that is the case, why should you deal with multiple indentations or multiple then closes? It could read this simple, you know, wait for the first file. After you receive the contents, do something else. After you see the contents, do something else, which is, you know, which reads really simple. But again, if there are any other requests coming in from a client, you can execute it which means multiple clients can be asking for the same information simultaneously, which is a little bit better. Now, question. That means you have to wrap every method from node that you use into promises to be able to use async and await. Yes. So nowadays, almost every single library out there in Node.js environment works with promises, and async and await. Again, we're using async and await in conjunction with promises. The read file method, read file function is still there. It's still returning promise. It reads very ugly. This is very ugly. But imagine that this is another developer doing it, writing uh, that ugly code for you. And you're using it very nicely in a, in a very readable format. So what we do in every asynchronous operation we're doing promises, we're writing promises. And then uh, when we're consuming those functionality, we're using async await, which reads super nice. If you're using any library, any asynchronous library, for example, chalk isn't asynchronous. Chalk is synchronous. Chalk, the library that we use for printing color, is a synchronous library. Um, but if you're using any asynchronous library, for example, to read from a database and everything, 
um, they will be returning promises. So you can easily do this. Await functionality. Okay. Any questions? Please. So the question is, when do I use promises and when do I use async await? If you already have a promise in your hand, you should always use async await to consume it. If you don't have a promise yet and um, you don't have async await, nothing, you only have callbacks, then you should be creating promises. For read file functionality, for example, Node.js APIs don't use promises. Node.js APIs use callbacks. So whenever you're using an Node.js API like read file, you should be creating a promise and operating on that promise. Whenever you are using a, an old library that doesn't support promises and that only works with callbacks, you should be creating wrapper promises around them and use it in your code with async await. Does it clarify it a little bit? Yeah, um, let me try to clarify it once more. Callbacks are like fire. We don't touch them. Um, promises are like thongs that we use to deal with coal or hot coals that are burning. So we don't use callbacks at all if we can avoid it. Whenever we see a callback, we try to write a promise around it. And then, whenever we have promises, then we are free to use async await. So there's a, actually a very clear order. If you already have promises, there are no um, callbacks anyway, you directly use async await. If you have callbacks, you don't touch it. You just write promises around it, and then use async await. So the goal is to always use async await. And depending on if you have promises or not, you write promises. OK, any other questions? Any question over there? No? Are you, did I lose you? Please, question. How can you know if a function is asynchronous or not if you didn't write it? Is you either read the source code or hopefully there's a documentation about it that tells you what that function returns. Is it asynchronous? Is it synchronous? Is it using callbacks? Is it using promises? There should be a documentation to tell you. Any other questions? Maybe one. Yeah. I don't No. Promises. So there is a function called promiseify. You know, we have JSON stringify. We have a function called promiseify, which takes in any regular callback function and converts it into a promise automatically. Maybe you're um, referring to that. Yeah, so there are multiple solutions to this. Obviously, you don't have to write promises for every callback that you have. You can just promiseify them. Um, but I don't really use them myself. I don't know. I'm an old school person on that regard. Um, you know, that's literally the a couple of lines that I'm going to write. I refuse to use the library for it and, and write my own promises. Um, Okay, now I'm going to move on to a new topic. Before that, did I lose you? Are you bored? Are you following still? Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of other examples that is related to your homework. This is the challenging bit. Um, oh, wait. Let's run this. 
before we move on to more like harder topics, let's run this code. So I have a couple of console logs here with a function called set timeout. What set timeout does is it takes in a, a function, bless you, it takes in a function and executes it after some time. This executes after 10,000 milliseconds, which is 10 seconds. This executes after seven seconds. This executes after three seconds. Okay. The question is, what is the order? What will be the order that I see at the output? Is it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or what is the order? Which will be the first print? Which will print first? You can shout. It's fine. One. Anyone else? One. What is the second one? Three. Next one? Four, six, what is the next one? Zero. Zero. Why? Okay. Okay. What is the next one? Seven. And the final ones? Two and five. Let's see if that's actually the case. Obviously, I don't know. Week three timeout example. I'm just going to run it. OK, one, three, four, six, zero, seven, and two, five. Yay. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Just join me. OK, great. Um, no class was ever able to guess this. So that's why you, you had to clap for ourselves. Um, and that, that kind of proves that this class, the contents up to this point, were kind of successful. Um, yeah. I've been giving this lecture for the third time. This is the first time that the class got it in order um, without me hand holding. So that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a couple of examples I told you. The first one is async file read that we went through. Uh, we went through timeout example. It was very simple. We implemented the object mapping. Um, you can get this code again on GitHub. Right now it's available. I encourage you to read through this code and try to see what's going on here again. We have Mart and Arman attending, and then we're loading the file. But if you look at the classes, we're actually creating um, new instances in those classes, right? Meetup class knows how to create a Meetup instance. And this is actually why you need to put this, delegate this responsibility to the Meetup class. Now, if you remember, Meetups have attendees, right? Without attendees, a Meetup is useless. It doesn't do anything. So whenever we're creating a meetup, whenever we have that attendees object, we know that they are people, right? We know that as a result of creating a meetup, we should also create people, because those people might want to attend other meetups, right? That is why we're actually doing an extra work here in this create function. We are first creating the meetup with the name and the location. And then we are creating people outside of attendees. There is a special function called map that takes in an array, runs that through another function, and creates another array. And what it does here is it's running them through the person create function. This might come across as a little bit confusing. Um, but this was the thing that we did before in the first hour. We created this create function, right, in the person class. We have a very simple new person name age um, create function. In the meetup, we are creating people outside of those attendees so that those attendees can also attend to other meetups so that they also have behavior, right? Do I make sense? Not a lot of heads are nodding. So tell me, tell me where I lost you. 
The idea is a meetup is an object, has multiple attendees as objects. We are creating a meetup instance. When we read from the database, we convert that object into a meetup instance so that it has behavior like print attendee names. But the users, the attendees, they are still objects. Meetup can print attendee names, but those objects are powerless. They don't have any behavior. They cannot attend new meetups. In order for that to happen, we have to create new people out of it. Right? That is why you need this functionality. We are saying, OK, we created that meetup. It has an attendees array that is creating more people. Let me run this code and show you very quickly what it does. In This is not the correct index file. In the index file, I'm creating Mert and Arman and Women Take Makers Berlin. Arman is attending Women Take Makers Berlin. Mert is attending Women Take Makers Berlin. Um, and then we're saving it to data JSON. OK, let's run this and see what's happening. Create Mart, create Arman, create WTM Berlin. They are attending it. Report the names here. So we will take Makers Berlin meetup is held at Wayfair. I added a location as well. And number of attendees are two. We save the database. We load from the database. And now you know we have the name and the attendees. So here loaded file is an object. Bless you. Loaded file is an object um, with name and attendees. Right now, it didn't go through the meetup.create method yet. We didn't do it. If you remember, in the previous example, we added here const meetup equals meetup.create loaded file, right? Do you remember this? Yeah, this is what we did before. Because right now, if I don't have that line, if I don't have this line, loaded file dot print, you see it's not working. Print attendee names is not a function. It's undefined because it's still an object. What I'm doing is I'm creating a real meetup from that. Now, let's go to that meetup.js. And let's comment out this attendees as if we didn't do it, right? Let's run this again. Um, let's run the meetup name. Marit, Arman, WTMB, they're attending. We actually don't need these anymore. So in order not to confuse you, I'm going to remove these things. We're reading from the database. We are creating a meetup. Right now, meetup. Well, here in this example, it's called report. Meetup.report exists. It's a function that I can call because I created a meetup out of it, right? Let's rerun this. We load the database. We try to create the meetup. The next line will be this create function on the right. We are creating a new meetup. And we run, and we can log, you know, we can say, meetup.report. This will work. We can also log meetup.attendees zero name. This should also work. Let's run this. Meetup report. Oh, it threw an error. Cannot read property name of undefined. Oh, wait. Ah. OK, see what happened, what the error is? It has zero attendees right now. In the JSON, there are actually two people. In the data JSON, there are actually two people attending that meetup. But we have zero of them. We ran into the same problem before, and we solved it. If you remember, we're not passing in attendees as a parameter, right? And the default value is how we indicated here. The default value is an empty array. And here, let's pass in attendees. Now let's run this. 
you have two attendees and the name of the first attendee is Armand. This works. Let me create a new meetup. Const um, Wayfair meetup equals new meetup name Wayfair. Okay. Now, can Armand attend Wayfair meetup? Will this work? What? Location. Yeah, great. Let's pass in a location. <laughs> so this is not going to work because it says meetup attendee zero that attendee is not a function. Why is that meetup attendee zero is still an object? That's why I need this line. I need to override the attendees and say, hey, they're actually people. So create those people for me. Okay. And now, when I'm creating actual real people out of these attendees, when I run it, you're going to see that actually um, Armand was able to attend the Wayfair meetup. And when I report, Wayfair meetup is held at location and number of attendees are one. If you see the object here, Wayfair meetup attendees is Armand. So Armand is able to attend that meetup right now. This is a complex object creation logic. That's why it cannot be in index.js. That's why you have to wrap it in a, in a way that um, the original developers of that meetup will know. The original developers will know that we have attendees and they are people, therefore they have to be mapped to people, right? The developer of the index file doesn't have to know. It just assumes that there is the first um, user is a person and can attend to a meetup. All right, the last example that I'm gonna show you really quickly will blow your minds away. <laughs> um, this is gonna be the first entry to real software architecture. So, so far, we created objects, we created classes, we created files, modules, databases, right? All of them are good. This is the first time I'm introducing a concept of abstraction. We talked about delegating responsibilities to other classes, right? We said the index shouldn't care about creating certain things, like certain instances, Classes should take that responsibility, should know how that will happen. We are taking this to a whole new level by introducing services and models. If you remember, in the first week, when I was talking about classes, I was saying that classes are modeling the real world, real world objects, right? A meetup is a real world thing that we're having here. And in code, we're modeling it with these properties, name, location, attendees, whatever, right? That's why it makes sense to call this a meetup model. However, there are certain operations that we want to do on meetups. For example, you might want to search for all the meetups you might want to find the meetup with a given ID, right? You might want to delete a meetup. How are you going to do those? Where will those things live? And that is where services come into play. So we have the models, the meetup model, and the person model. They only know how to create meetups and people and they only know what properties they have right if i go and open a meetup or a person it knows name age meetups and i'm saving something called id so that i can find them later on by their ids like a user id it knows how to attend the meetup it knows how to create a person this is modeling a, a person but how do i package the functionality of finding, creating, deleting, updating people. That is where services come into play. 
And if you go to a person service right now, it's very simple. I created a new class called base service. And this is new um, syntax for you. You can read more about it throughout the week. I'm saying I have a person service, which is a class that is extending base service. So it's inheriting all the properties of the base service. It is a base service, but it's kind of specializing it in a way. In what way? It knows what model it's going to work on, person model, right? And where the database for that model is. It's person database. Because for a meetup database, you have meetup database.json. So let's have this. Let's open a new file, and let's look up, look at the meetup service. It's basically the same thing. I am um, encapsulating the functionality, a very complex functionality of finding, deleting, updating records and everything in a database in something called a base service. And I'm specializing it with meetup and person services. You know, they're very simple, right? They look deceptively simple. This is how the software should look. All the files that you open until you get to the very end, very last file, should be very straightforward, very simple. And what do we have in the base service? The base service is what I'm offering you for free. <laughs> you should take this and implement it in your homeworks. Because I will ask you to convert the classes that you have right now into service calls. So you will be extending the base service for your models. A base service allows you to find all the records in a database. You might be saving multiple meetups, multiple people. It allows you find, uh, to find all the records. And here you see there's somewhat a good error handling. I'm handling if the file is not there, create an empty file, and then resolve or reject. So I want you to study this file extensively. And if you have any questions, come back um, during the week. It can add a new item to the database. right? It's almost doing database save. So the functionality here is we're finding all the items, we're getting the uh, ID of the last item, and we're saving them back to the database again. I'm like another backend developer in your team. I did this file, this service, and I'm giving out to you. You, as other backend engineers, are taking this file and implementing it in your models and making use of it. Okay? You can delete an item. You can find an item. You can save multiple items. How you use it is here. Again, this is an asynchronous function. I'm using async await. All the stuff that I taught you today, there's a main function that I'm executing. So I'm creating Mert and Arman. Okay. I'm awaiting the person service to add these to the database. And then I'm finding all the people, person service that find all. As a user in index.js, I don't want to know any more details. I just want to talk to a person service to do everything for me. There is no database save, database load. That, those are not my concerns. Those are the concerns of the server, okay? uh, the, the service. What I do is person service that add merits, do whatever you want, save it to a database. I don't care. I'm the user of it. I'm adding Mert and Arman, and I'm finding all the users. You can log the people. You can add a new meetup to the meetup service that should add all the users. And then um, you know, I can say, find the first meetup, for example. Let's run this code. OK, I don't have chalk, obviously. Week three. NPM install. 
let's run this code. And the meetup database has some stuff in it. Person database has some stuff in it. I filled the databases. Now let's remove, as we did before, let's remove creating these Marts, Armand, and everything. And let's find all the people. And let's find the first meetup. Okay. I run this. The people here. It gave me two persons back. So you can do people zero is Mart. It has meetups. Okay. These are all created for me, ready to use. I can find the first meetup. And oh, I gave the meetup ID. I wanted to have the first meetup. I just did meetup service that find one, and it gave me the meetup. And meetup has the attendees. Meetup attendees zero is Armon. Right? It works. And I I can do meetup dot report. Let's run it, and you say women take makers Berlin meetup is held at Wayfair. A number of attendees are two. Now, this is the code that you should be writing for your backend applications. As developers, as backend developers, you shouldn't be dealing with the other stuff, creating these things, saving them, loading them, mapping them. They should be wrapped in services. Sometimes, of course, you will be required to write those base services, base services, but most of the time it's another developer. And it should be this easy to use. Find the meet up with the ID one, find the meet up with the ID two, maybe it won't find it. Um, or, you know, you can say, delete the first person, and then it should remove it from the database. This is all built in, so um, you can actually, it's not delete, but it's del. Um, you can actually see that this is working. Person database is here. We have a lot of items here. Like Armon is here. And I can actually delete him. And it's going to update the person database. There won't be Arm. Well, there's no, OK. There's no ID one. <laughs> Or maybe we do. I don't know. <laughs> it should be working. Um, anyway, I'm a little bit over time by three minutes. But that was because we took 20 minutes instead of 15 in the break. Just kidding. So the homework is to take this base class and implement it in at least one of your models. Um, in the next weeks, next weeks we're going to move to MongoDB, a real database. Before we do that, I want you to experience how it's working with services, what it means to work with services. So I know you have a lot of entities, a lot of models in your classes. Um, we will convert them into MongoDB models after the fifth week. Before that, please convert at least one of your models into a service-based architecture. Okay, This is a state-of-the-art architecture that every single company uses in the world. This is pretty much the de, de facto way of building applications. You have models, you have services. This is called domain-driven design. There's a great book called Domain-Driven Design, if you'd like to read it. It's a very heavy book, 750 pages. Um, it's very advanced, but it is the, basically the foundation of all software architecture. Um, if you know domain-driven design by heart, you're a very good software architect. We're still trying to figure out. you know, I, I think I read it five or six times already. Every time I read it, every couple of years, I'm finding new meanings in it. It's a great book, great reference book. Um, and we have these domain models and domain services. You can read about them online. Don't read blog posts. I mean, definitely do read them. But don't take them for granted, because it's very difficult to understand domain-driven design. And probably any blog post that you're going to find about it 
will give you a wrong information. So <laughs> the best is to read from the source. The book is out there. It's human readable, so it just takes a lot of time. Um, but if you really want to be software engineers, you should be um, reading and knowing that, that book by heart. The gist of the idea is we have services and models that I already showed you, and I'm sharing the, um, the code with you. Again, in every single company that you're going to go, you're going to see these things. There is a service that does find, delete, update, whatever. There are models, just like we did. And then there are these index files that are working with these things. Um, if you have, if you're working in companies as a designer or you know in an, in any other role, you can um, bug your developers, engineers to show you their code. You're probably going to find similar things. Maybe not the exact same naming, exact same architecture, but it will be similar. If not, come to me, um, and maybe I can coach them for better software architecture. <laughs> um, all right, is the homework clear? Convert at least one of your models into a service-based architecture, services and models, and use those find, delete functionality. Because next week, we're going to do REST APIs. We're going to write a web server. And there, you will be adding stuff to your databases from the browser or from um, another environment. So you're going to be building your real application for the first time that people will use. Um, obviously, you need to be able to create records, delete records, right? update some records, or fetch some of them, or all of them. So this will be very useful for next week as well. Uh, I hope you liked it. Thank you for staying longer. <laughs> Thanks. If you have any questions, in the meantime, please ask us over Slack. Thank you.